He was described as a Sunday painter, yet painted every day of the week. His paintings were called naive and unsophisticated by the snobbish art establishment of the day, yet his pictures are addictive, and to study him is to become obsessed by him. His subjects, people, are everywhere, and acutely observed. They're not matchstick men, but warm-blooded human beings, mobile and busy, intent on their lives and loves. He was into his 60s before there was any real recognition of his work, and now his paintings sell for millions of pounds. Born in Barrett Street, Stretford, near Manchester, in 1887, to a middle-class family, he was to become a disappointment to the mother he adored, one for not being born a girl, and then for not living up to her expectations of his private school education. He declined an OBE, a CBE, a knighthood, and a companion of honor twice, and holds the record for the most declined honors. He lived with artistic derision most of his life, but now, 30 or so years later after his death, some say he's the greatest English painter since Turner. And his name? Well, of course, it's L.S. Lowry. Lowry is famous for his distinctive scenes of life in the industrial districts of northern England during the early part of the 20th century. His urban landscapes and the people who populated them were painted in drab colours. He also had a fascination with painting derelict buildings where he imagined children could have played happily in years gone by. He painted brooding portraits and secret marionette works found only after his death. And he also painted the South Wales industrial landscape in the 1960s having been invited here by his close friend, Valley's Welshman, Monty Bloom. One such location is here in Bargoid, high above the viaduct on the road to Brithdir, and I'm delighted to be joined by Monty's son, Martin Bloom, a businessman who also became a friend of Lowry's and is an ardent collector of his paintings. Martin, your father, Monty Bloom's name, crops up in all the biographical studies of Lowry. I believe his first contact with Lowry was as a collector of art. Was this a business enterprise or a personal interest? Well, it was very much personal. In fact, my father had never actually collected any art before he met Lowry. In fact, it goes back to the John Reed BBC documentary in 1957. And you know, as he watched this documentary, he saw scenes that were very reminiscent of his upbringing in Ebervale. Anyway, as a result of that programme, my father was very interested in Lowry and through a connection, uh, managed to arrange for a commission that Lowry was painting for him. And they actually met, coincidentally, at an exhibition by uh, two chimpanzees in Manchester. And uh, Lowry was there. And my father uh, went up and introduced himself. And Lowry um, replied, Oh, Mr. Bloom, I've got a painting for you. And uh, my father drove Lowry home that evening. And he looked at the painting. It was an industrial scene. He liked it, but he looked around him and he saw a number of isolated single figures. And he said to Mr. Lowry, Mr. Lowry, I like the painting a lot, but I much prefer those. And at the end of the evening, he bought six of them. And it was the first of those type of paintings that Lowry had ever sold. In fact, they weren't very popular at the time. And one of them he'd sent to his dealer in London and they sent it back saying, Mr. Lowry, this doesn't seem to be finished. And how much did this cost your father? Well, he bought the six paintings for £90, and he kept going back. And from that moment on, they, uh, they met regularly. They met once a week. Uh, they went on uh, holidays together. In fact, it was only six weeks later that they went to South Wales, because my father suggested to Larry that the uh, industrial environment there was very reminiscent of uh, the Manchester and Salford scenes that he'd been painting. And um, my father said, well, when will you be ready? He said, well, I've only got one suit, and I'm wearing it and it'll only take me uh, half an hour to throw everything else together. But six weeks later, they went together down to Wales, and they went every six months for at least six years. Where we are at the moment is overlooking Bargoy Town from the spot we think he painted it in 1965. I can see the train station, the viaduct, and a stump of a tip in the background. Martin, you've very kindly brought along some photographs that help us identify this vantage point. One is of Lowry actually making a sketch of Bargoid Tip, but you also have two photographs of two Bargoid Tip paintings. Two Bargoid paintings, Martin? Yes, uh, Lowry did two. There was a, um, a time between them. They weren't both done at the same time, and they varied very differently in style. 
What's also very interesting is that the one my father bought uh, was slightly larger than the other one because basically Larry used the uh, the board that the his canvases were were wrapped in, so it's actually the largest painting he ever actually uh, painted, and Larry used to refer to it as the chairman of the board, uh, in 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 the connection of my father's collection. There's this photograph of Lowry, lovely photograph of him sitting on a railing. Uh, making a sketch for the painting. Was that your father who took th that particular photograph? Very much so, yes. Uh, they went around together throughout South Wales and my, my father documented it, took photographs and um, you, know, you can see from the original sketch uh, exactly what Larry saw in the geometry of the industrial landscape which was very different from anything he'd done before. It took a long time for Lowry to gain the respect of the art world. He was considered naive and an amateur even by some and this must have demoralised him but do you think your father was instrumental in Lowry's gaining greater status as an artist? I think certainly my father was very influential in the later years, with the later works. And in 1962, Frank Constantine from the Graves Art Gallery in Sheffield came up to borrow a couple of paintings for an exhibition and ended up borrowing 39. As a result of that, Morris Collis uh, wrote about uh, uh, the exhibition and then later in 1964, only two years later, the marshals of the Stone Gallery borrowed 48 uh, works. And again, you know, as a result of that, Edward Mullins wrote about the exhibition in the Sunday Telegraph. So certainly I think the fact that uh, this was the first time that people had seen this side of Larry's work was very influential. That must great, give you great satisfaction to be associated with that. Oh, very um, much so. And which paintings did your father collect of Lowry's, which particular ones? Well, when I was young, I sort of grew up with them around the house. So you know, I remember in my bedroom, I had the, uh, the boy in the yellow jacket or you know, the, the boy with the staring eyes, very staring, deep staring red eyes. In addition, he had a, a range of them, the woman with the beard, father and sons. And what was interesting is that uh, my father used to have people over to play bridge and some of them refused to come if the Lowry's were left on the wall because they found them so uh, repulsive. <laughs> It was, what was interesting is that when Larry became successful, they criticised my father for not persuading them to buy a, one of them. How many paintings did he actually have? Well, I don't remember the exact number, but what was interesting was that uh, you know, my mother felt that uh, they would just be coming everywhere, and, my, and she really tried to persuade my father to uh, stop collecting them. But what he used to do is he used to bring them back in the boot of the car, and when she'd gone to bed, he would then put them in the garage or put them in the spare cupboard. So uh, eventually the house uh, w was full of them, not only on the walls, but uh, a large number of them were hidden in cupboards and in, in the garage. I think my father was very obsessive in that sense. You know, he, he was the traditional collector. Uh, he had a uh, collecting bug. And when my father moved to Bournemouth, which he did for his health, he couldn't keep all the painting because he moved to a flat and it was too small. So he actually uh, sold a large number of the works at a gallery in London but he, he missed them so much that he actually ended up buying back about uh, 10 of the works uh, at a higher price than he'd sold them for. And this was only a week or two later. You know, he really couldn't bear to part with them. We're told that Lowry led quite a lonely life on the one hand, having spent much of it caring for a rather unappreciative mother. Also that he had a full-time job as a rent collector all his life. On the other hand, it seems that he did have a few close friends, but he kept his friendships very much in compartments. The people he was close to didn't always know about the other friends, nor did they know anything about his day job. There's even some suggestion that he had Asperger's syndrome. But what do you remember of Lowry as a man, Martin? Was he the self-denigrating and secretive loner, as is sometimes described? I don't really see him that way. He had a great sense of humour. He did have friends, I mean, he lived alone, that's true, but that doesn't mean he was lonely. And the fact that he uh, had a number of friends which he kept in compartments is probably just that uh, he wasn't a very trusting person. Uh, but certainly he was uh, a great fun to be with, he was very humorous, very comical, dry sense of humor. He was also very cynical about authority as well, which again was one of the reasons my father and, uh, got on so well with him, because they, they shared that trait. But it's very interesting that uh, people pick up on the fact that he was a rent collector. It's true that people didn't know about this while he was alive, or very few people. But actually, it was a very positive. 
because it helps him go out and see people in their homes, see people uh, in the lives that they were leading. So it made him much more human as an artist. It enabled him to see their lives as, the, as it was lived. But I, I actually uh, see there's a certain dichotomy in some of the analyses made after his death by people who didn't know him. So you know, as to him having Asperger's syndrome, I think they're, they're taking other people's interpretations of what they think Lowry must have been like. As I say, he lived alone, but he wasn't lonely. In a sense, he was a typical bachelor. He wanted to retain his independence and decide on who he met and who he didn't meet. And what impact has Lowry had on your life, Marty? He's had a great, great impact, obviously. One of my careers is as a professional photographer. Because I grew up with the paintings around me, I have a very visual way of looking at the world. And sometimes when I'm uh, framing a shot, I frame the core and then wait for the people to populate it, like they used to in Larry's paintings. Well, Martin, it's been fascinating talking to you and actually coming up here to the spot where he, he made the painting. It's been a thrill to chat with you and all good wishes for your career as a photographer. Thank you very much. I'm just sad that my father couldn't be here today because uh, you know, he died in 1996 and uh, I'm sure he would have been able to illuminate much more than I could have done. Idris Davis's The Bells of Rumney, which no longer harmonise with colliery hooters with pithead wheels or hobnail boots on stone. Today's sound effects of the valleys, today's bell chimes, question the absence of pits in Rumney, Neath, Swansea, Six Bells, wherever you care to mention. And also here in Bargoid, where I've come to meet art historian John Wilson, who has witnessed this industrial decline in the South Wales coalfields. John has a special interest in the industrial history of this area and the impact of this on the arts. He's been guest curator at Newport Museum and Art Gallery, and he's also a local boy who went to school here. In fact, he's probably passed this very spot where Lowry painted many times. John, we're looking at a photograph of Lowry's famous painting of Bargoy Tip, which now hangs in the Lowry Museum in Salford. Is this the landscape of your childhood? Yes, I went to school in Pengam Grammar School and the whole horizon was dominated there from the school by Britannia tip and also a little further up where we are now, Bargoid. I remember running cross country from school. My first sight of Bargoid pit was I was running down the high street and there was a big gap between the shops and there it was, monumental, the tip towering above. And then as I looked closer you could see the railway wagons moving along the tracks you could see miners moving around in orange overhauls, the winding gear, the, the noise was quite deafening, and it was all just behind the high street, hard to believe. And especially now as we look at this landscape, and you can just about make out where the pit head was, and even the coal tip, which was so dominating, it bounded your horizon line. Even that is now reclaimed, softened out, almost disappearing back into the landscape. This painting was called Bargoid Tip, but it wasn't always known as that, was it, John? No, in Mervyn Levy's book, published in 1975 on Lowry, this image is identified as the Ronda. But there is a tradition of artists representing this tip. It's not any old tip. It appears in a small sketch in Kenneth Rowntree's A Prospect of Wales book in 1948. But actually in 1960, there's a large painting by James Tarr, of Valley Pit Bargoid, and this was exhibited at the Royal Academy Summer Show in 1960, and Newport Museum and Art Gallery bought it from that show. So it's not any old tip, it actually reached something of an iconic status, you could say. 
and maybe as time unfolds future historians will look at the Lowry image as a seminal piece. It's clearly important for his later development and maybe will become the most well-known image of a coal tip. But to think that Lowry painted this in 1965, within a decade, within 15, within 20 years, the whole area was decimated, the pits went. Lowry attracted attention initially because he chose to paint workers and industrial scenes, yet by the time he came to this area, he'd actually stopped painting this kind of picture. What he found here revived his interest. But the Welsh paintings have a very different treatment, don't they, John? He seemed to be fascinated by the relationship of a bleak industrial landscape to its unspoiled greener surroundings. Would you say his was an astute observation of this particular area? Exactly. This Lowry painting shows the pit, the coal village, within a landscape. And in fact, what South Wales has is the presence of both town and country in one place. Raymond Williams, the Welsh cultural critic, has spoken about a particular structure of feeling, that this is both town and country. It's a strong theme in the Welsh industrial novel. Similarly, painters recorded this and they have responded to the visual spectacle. Lowry was there in, in a whole cultural context of artists painting and drawing the industrial landscape. This was an important moment in Lowry's development. And if we look at the images that Lowry produced in South Wales, then he's clearly struck by the landscape. There's colour in them. And it relates to this theme of both town and country in one place and an all-enveloping landscape. In 1988, a member of the local town council saw a reproduction of the Bargoid painting in a bookshop and had the idea of trying to organise an exhibition of it in the local library here in Bargoid. I gather you visited the exhibition, John. Do you have any particular memories of the reaction to it in the town? I was amazed. I'd got off the bus at Bargoid station saw this sign saying Lowry exhibition in the library. I thought, oh, it's prints. I went in and there was this monumental oil painting of Bargoid Tip. And I couldn't believe how many people were in there. And, and how would you account for this popularity in, I mean, many people perhaps here wouldn't normally visit an art gallery. I'm not sure. This wasn't a painting in something like a chapel type art gallery you're afraid to talk in. This was a painting in the environment it was painted. It was in the library. People were used to going to the library. And don't forget, there's a strong local tradition of amateur art. You have a Bargoid local art society. So all in all, at various levels, people were really enthused about this. So it was the perfect location in many respects. It was, and it was basically their painting. John, as a local living here at the time, do you think Lowry captured the essence of a South Wales industrial landscape in this painting? Yes, Lowry captures the visual spectacle of the industrial landscape. What is significant is, given Lowry's stature as a British artist, suddenly to have Welsh landscape, Welsh industry, elevated to that status, I think, is very important. And arguably, as an outsider, views it with fresh eyes. There's the shock of a new experience in Lowry's vision. And for local people, maybe this makes them stand back and say, well, yes, this is quite a landscape that we live in. Something to be proud of. Yes. Also, of course, the landscape itself is a monument to labour. The coal tip is a monument to labour. Coal tips were not just coal tips. They were the result of labour, and people knew that. So it's not just a painting of a landscape with a coal tip, without figures in it. It is actually some kind of epic statement about labour, and the heroic nature of this landscape and these people.
I've now come to Six Bells, close to Abertilleri in Blaenau Gwent, where Lowry took lodgings and painted. One such painting is entitled Hillside in Wales, and the subject looks like an ancient Celtic site or monument nestling in the landscape. I've come here to meet Valerie Gantz, an active and successful landscape painter who now lives in Swansea. She paints a variety of subjects, but like Lowry, has a strong interest in the landscape of South Wales, particularly the landscape of industrial areas. In 1985, she rented a house, again like Lowry, here at Six Bells, and for nearly a year worked at the Six Bells Colliery, painting alongside the miners at work, both above ground and at the coalface. Valerie, you clearly have a compulsion to paint industrial themes, something you share with Ellis Lowry. Your Six Bells residency is particularly interesting in the context of Lowry, who painted exactly the same place. Do you think you were drawn to this place for the same reasons? I didn't even know about Lowry's painting of Six Bells, but I was particularly drawn to Six Bells after searching for many hundreds of miles because it was the first time I'd seen a mine of really great interest to paint. The buildings were so interesting, and it was right in the heart of the community. It was the reason for the community, and they were centred around it. And I think probably Lowry felt exactly the same compulsion, because it had that energy and vibrancy about it. And his Welsh industrial pictures are quite different from the Lancashire ones, aren't they? As someone who's studied the same landscape so intimately, what do you think gives them their inherent Welshness? Well, most of his um, Lancashire ones are of broad, flat areas where the industry sort of spreads out and spreads out and it, it can go on forever, you feel. But, of course, in these deep valleys, you've got the, the heart of the valley, the depth of the valley, filled with the energy and the enormous activity. But you've only got to raise your eyes um, halfway up the sides of the valleys and you're into rural landscape. And you can never get far from rural landscape, which is why it is so special. And they're brighter paintings, aren't they, I think, yes. these later ones of yes. Lowry's? Yes. Well, it's, it's a brighter subject. The valleys were much blacker. I mean, now, with the demise of heavy industry, they've become green as they always would have been years ago. But in Lowry's time, they were at their blackest. But it still didn't match the bleak blackness of the Lancashire landscape. Lowry painted people in many ways earlier on quite simplistically and some of the later paintings were quite grotesque. There were these marionette paintings. What are your thoughts on the way Larry paints people? Well, I love his people from a distance and the, the swirls of movement. For instance, in the painting of the pond, the various activities going on and people hurrying to and fro and the feeling of energy and movement, I think, is lovely. And then you'll see one figure breaking from the rest, and it might be a little boy kicking a ball or running with a dog. And they're absolutely delightful. They're almost like those Bruegel paintings where you, yes. you look in the corner and you see somebody pushing a sledge. Or... Yes. You feel like he had a great affection for them. I mean, his later paintings where he paints uh, figures individually, and in more detail, the ones they refer to as his grotesques were extraordinary, but he paints them with sympathy. The stereotypical Lowry has people interacting with the landscape, and as far as we're aware, most of the work done in Wales is of landscape and, and not people. Why, Valerie, do you think this is the case? Well, when he was painting his northern landscapes, he lived among them. They were people coming out of the house next door to him. He was part of that. And uh, when he comes to Wales, he is a visitor and he starts from a distance. I don't know whether he always did that, but I know when I'm attacking a new subject, I tend to stand back and you'll find I do a landscape with a tiny mine in the middle of it. And then 
I work in more gradually until the mind dominates and then move in and you've got the people dominating. So it's a definite movement with me and it could well have been with him and he didn't stay here long enough to do that. And Lowry came several times to this area and must have formed some bond with the place eventually. Was the knowledge of his having been here an inspiration to you at all? I was very excited about it, yes. I mean, when you hear that Turner has been here and when you hear that Sisley and so on and so forth, it all adds to the richness of our culture and you see it with new eyes and new people. I mean, you can look at a view and say, oh, that's a Lowry view, oh, that's a Turner sky, and so on. I mean, it sounds very trite to say that, but it does stimulate you to look more deeply at your environment. Valerie, he went to see a fortune teller, did he not? Yes. The extraordinary thing is that I rented a house at number one Victoria Road and he was a regular visitor to number six Victoria Road to visit a clairvoyant. I've often wondered, he was rather old to be looking to what was going to happen in the future, was he trying to contact his mother that he was so obsessed with? And I wonder if that was the reason for this uh, regular visit. It's a f fascinating it's poignant, thought, isn't it? isn't it? Finally, Valerie, what impact did Wales have on Lowry as a painter? Well, just before coming to Wales, he had started to slow down and really losing the impetus. And he came here and it reawakened. And he had new vigour in his work and saw things with new eyes. And I think that gave him a huge step forward. He didn't continue greatly with industrial landscape, but there's no doubt about it. It moved him on in an amazing way. And, um, well, I have 